Hey, good morning, Crossroads. We're so thankful to be joining you this morning in your homes or wherever you're tuning in. Let's go and sing out to the King of Kings this morning as we cast all our cares, all our anxiety, everything upon Him. We can trust our Lord at all times. Let's worship Him together as we place our worries upon Him. Let's sing it out, all the worries of the world. And all the worries of this world. I will lay them at your feet Surrender every anxious thought For perfect peace Yes, Lord Your perfect peace Only He can do that And all the loved ones I hold dear And all my hopes and dreams And all my fears I would choose to trust your name in everything, oh, with everything. We sing to him. And I will look up, for there is none above you. I will bow down to tell you that I need you, Jesus, Lord of all. Yes, you are. Jesus, Lord of all, oh, we trust you, God, and I will take you at your word. Cause Jesus, you have taken hold of me, and all my life is in your hands. You are my strength. You are my strength.
your name and into darkness your mercy came thank you lord oh you call me out you lifted me up how great is your love yes it is oh my weakness you took my shame everything lord bury my burdens in fields of grace you call me out, you lift me up. How great is your love? From the heights of heaven, you step down to earth. In a sin perfection, you gave your life for us. And we are amazed. Yes, we stand belong. How great is your love? How great, how great, how great is your love for us? Oh, with your kindness, you lead me home. It's in your presence where I belong, yes, Lord. Oh, you call me out, you lifted me up. How great. Think of that matchless love. Cause there has never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. There has never been, there will never be oh, a God like you, a love so true. Never been no, there will never be oh, a God like you, and the so true. There's never been, oh, there will never be a God like you, and the so true. Yeah, how great, how great, how great. How great, how great is your love? How great, how great, yes, Lord. How great is your love for us? Oh, how great, how great, how great is your love? How great, how great, how great is your love? We proclaim how great, how great. How great is your love for us? Yes, it is. One more time, just our voices. How great, how great, how great is your love? How great, how great, how great is your love? How great, how great, how great is your love for us?
sing out that he is worthy alone. Let's sing that together. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Holy 
God, when everything is stripped away, we know that your love remains. God, when we live in a world of chaos, we know that we can trust you at all times. And as we live in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit are exhibited to those around us in love. God, I pray that we would emulate your love that we would prize you so much, Jesus, that it would just come pouring out of us. God, may we surrender more to you today. We pray it every week. But we know that we're weak, God. We know that we're frail. And we need to be drawn back to you daily. So work in our hearts this morning. We ask in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So good to worship with you guys this morning in spirit and in truth. Um, in the past few weeks, we've been uh, looking at these uh, videos uh, just about our staff, the people that we serve with here, uh, men and women. And today we have an opportunity to um, get to know one of our elders a little bit better. This is the Neal family. Um, you're going to love this. Let's take a look at our screens. Well, uh, here we are, Wilderness 2.1, and we thought it would be fun as we enter into the summer to just spend some time, get to know some of our elder couples, some of our staff couples. And so we are here with Rudy and Angela Neal. Been married for 30 years. 30 years to 26 of this month. All right. Happy anniversary. Thank you, sir. Uh, one daughter, Mackenzie. Yes. yes. And uh, here at Crossroads for about five years. Yes. Right? Yes. Rudy just recently joined the elder team. Yes, sir. And so uh, we just want to spend a little bit of time hearing from you. The big, I think, burning question, though, as uh, most people know, you're an owner operator of a Chick fil A restaurant. So the question is do you eat more chicken? <laughs> Like when you come home at the end of the day, being at the store, do you actually like put chicken on the grill or do you throw beef on the grill? Neither. <laughs> what do you eat at home? Nothing. <laughs> it's all just chicken at the store. No, honestly, um, we do a variety of things. Chicken, every once in a while beef. I'm not a big beef eater, but yeah. you know. Probably nice more grilled chicken. You're haunted by the Chick-fil-A cow saying, yeah. eat more chicken, and so <laughs> you stay away from this. the beef. I, I <laughs> don't eat as much chicken chicken at the restaurant as I once did before I got the restaurant. Yeah, I mean, for those of us that don't work at Chick-fil-A, we yeah. probably go, like, we'll eat it all the time, right? <laughs> Seven times a day. Yeah. And the question then is, like, what's your favorite dipping sauce? 
I don't like any of them because they're all cold. I like <laughs> hot, temperature-wise, I like hot sauces. And barbecue would be my favorite if it were hot. Okay, so a hot barbecue. You the um, I will eat, um, usually I will use Chick-fil-A sauce, the original, or Polynesian. Yeah. Those are probably my two favorites. By far, the Chick-fil-A sauce is like the most popular. Yes. yes. Right? For those of us wondering, yes. addicted to it, who would drink whenever it someone, out of a straw. Whenever someone comes in and asks for ketchup, I know I'm like, okay, they're not a raving man. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we probably can gather from your accent. Yes. You're not original Californians. No, sir. You're from the South. Yes. So tell us what Southerners, what are the weirdest things that Southerners think about Californians? Like before you move to California, you're like, oh, those Californians, they eat that or they <laughs> do that. What, what, uh, what was your impression of the Californians before you became one? I don't think Californians generally are very neighborly. I mean, like, I don't really know my neighbors that well. I've been there yeah. five years. Had that been me in the South, oh, we would have exchanged numbers. We would have had each other over. Oh, do you need this to cook? Do you need that to cook? Where do you want me to run and get you something? If you're sick, bring me some soup. That doesn't happen here. Everybody's kind of in their own little world. Normally, like in the South, uh, at least where we live, we lived in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, and experienced the same thing. Every, each one of the different neighborhoods we lived in, we were there, is when you first go and, you know, you'll have your neighbors come and uh, they'll bring you cakes, cookies, something, introduce themselves, welcome you into the neighborhood. We didn't get that here. Yeah, so. yeah. But, we, could use, we could use some Southern hospitality <laughs> here in Southern California. <laughs> so I'm hoping that wasn't your experience when you got to Crossroads. No, what what no. was your first impression when you came to the church? Very inviting, people, you know, welcomed us in, very friendly. Uh, obviously the thing, and I'm just being totally honest, what really got us hooked is uh, Pastor Ty's teaching, you yes, know? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I remember he and I had a conversation and and he asked me, he said, what would keep you here? I said, as long as you bring the word, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, because we, I mean, our desire is to grow uh, spiritually, be challenged and, um, you know, get some meat. Yeah. Not just the icing on the cake, so to speak, but the meat. Yeah. Yeah, you guys are always sitting in the front row for yes. people that don't always get yes. to see. Spit zone. The spit zone. <laughs> yes. You're eager. I've been up there. You're eager to receive <laughs> the word. You love it. Yeah. And you're always ready afterwards to pray with people. Yes. Uh, I, I just sense that you have a real heart to want to help people grow, pray with them. Yes. If you're talking to your Crossroads family now, uh, if you're praying for them now, what are the things you're praying God will do in our church family through this season? I know one thing I'm praying is that God would grant them joy and peace every day of the week. That's what I pray for in the midst of all that's going on. Asking God for his joy and peace and abundance will take a whole lot of things and make them much smaller. Um, and for them to remember that all of us are loved by our pastoral staff. We need to remember that yeah. because we feel your love. Yeah. We miss seeing you, yeah. but uh, it's it's for sure there. So yeah. those are good prayers for God's people. What would you say, Rudy? Yeah, and I, and I just believe that anytime there's a challenge of any kind, um, God allows it to happen, and there's always purpose in it. So my thing is, is as, as you pray and as you go through this, you don't want to come out on the other side the same person you were when you went in. Um, there's an opportunity to grow and get to see more of God's character and you know His ways as He reveals that to us. Um, because even in the midst of the pandemic, you know we as God's children can still have joy. As Angie said, we can still have peace. We don't have to fear. Um, you know, because that's not the spirit that God gives us. So for me personally, I, you know, I'm just like, okay, what is it God is trying to show me in the midst of this in terms for myself, how I lead my family, and how I encourage others. Amen.
Well, that's like a little teaser <laughs> that I hope uh, all of our Crossroads family uh, takes the opportunity both to, to hear from you, get to know you more. I know you love this body yes, and that you yes. want to get to know more and more of your brothers and sisters mm -hmm. here. But thanks for uh, sharing with us. Thank thanks you. for your faithfulness through this season. And I think we just want to remind all of our Crossroads family to keep loving one another during this Amen. time. Amen. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Crossroads, and uh, I have to say we love, love, love the, uh, the Neal family and for all of the uh, leadership, joy, prayer, encouragement that they bring uh, to our entire uh, church. And uh, so glad you joined us for the 1045 service, and uh, you know, life has changed again in a week, and um, uh, so I miss uh, some uh, human beings in the room, but uh, I'm really glad you're live streaming with us, and uh, we're going to get through this. Uh, we're going to get through this thing called COVID, and the best news is um, I was just reminded that there is no COVID in heaven, so we're going to a great place. Until then, uh, God's grace is going to be sufficient for us each day. I was reading a, a book this summer. It's called The Splendid and the Vile. It's by Eric Larson, and it's about the, uh, really about the first 100 days of Winston Churchill's uh, uh, government, and he was thrown right into the fire. And one of the things I picked up over the course of the book is the reality that the, um, uh, the English uh, and England was, was basically bombed every night for two years. And um, they were resilient people in that they continued to live and they continued, they went to the symphony, they went to the theater, people got married, they went on vacations, uh, they tried to find places that wasn't going to get bombed that night. And in many ways, uh, I, I was just taken back by their the tenacity to um, stay under it, literally. And I, I pray the same for us as, as, as God's people, that we have an endurance that James talks about, that we remain under this uh, challenge that we're all facing. Uh, and I have some good news, and that is we're working on uh, Wilderness 3.0, and I can tell you it's... It's actually the most exciting um, uh, uh, wilderness uh, plan uh, to date. Uh, we're working on a plan to build a tabernacle uh, so that we can not just get 100 people here on campus. We can get hundreds of people here on campus safely, uh, social distance and all of that good stuff, and have that in our back pocket uh, for, uh, for now until uh, we, we get out of uh, this whole COVID season. Uh, so you'll be hearing more about the Wilderness 3.0 uh, but know, um, know that there are some really exciting things that we think is going to energize us as a church heading into the fall with all of our Bible studies, small groups, and everything like that. At any rate, this morning we continue on in the series, The One Another's. We have a few more weeks uh, of One Another's, and then we're going to jump uh, in, I want to say back in, but we only had one sermon on uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to basically relaunch 1 Corinthians here after this uh, one another series. And so if you love Jesus, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we will slowly uh, track our way to that passage. And as you turn there or turn on your uh, devices, let me pray for us. Father, thanks for this time. Pray that your word would be uh, loud, bold, clear. Uh, Father, help, help all of us to hear your voice and only your voice. And then, Father, help us not just to uh, not just to hear a sermon this morning, help us to do a sermon this week. And uh, we know that we're, we're not really blessed in just hearing a sermon, we're blessed in doing it, as, as James has told us. And so help us to be doers of this one another, of submission one to another, of s surrendering one to uh, another. I pray that would be a, a natural practice coming from a supernatural um, energy of the Spirit in us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, today I want to teach you a, a dirty little wor word in our culture, and it's called submission. Um, the word submission doesn't ring true in our culture uh, very often. In fact, we're, a, uh, we're Americans. We, we declared our independence and if we're uh, students of the day, we realize 24-7 right now we're being bombarded with things like anarchy and riots and uh, defunding and mistrust and defacing, destroying all these things that 
seem to really not fit under the umbrella of submission. Uh, in fact, we as uh, Americans, we tend to prize autonomy much higher than authority. And we forget that, that authority is something uh, that God has given to us as a grace gift to us. Uh, we, we forget that quickly. We, we tend to be like the person who says, I, frankly, I, I, I don't have any, any problem with submission. It's, it's, it's authority that I struggle with. And, 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 and it just kind of, it shows the, kind of the, uh, the thought pattern of our hearts and minds. Uh, our God, our God is a God of order. Um, we, we've, we've learned that in many ways, in many different uh, uh, passages and texts that we've preached through, that our God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. He's not a God of disorder. Uh, COVID didn't catch him flat-footed. Uh, there is not a virus, a molecule um, that is in rebellion to his sovereign plan. Everything is, is being orchestrated under his sovereignty. And, and so God is always organizing. Uh, God is always uh, taking what is chaotic and bringing order to that. We saw that in Genesis. Uh, we saw that he, he took uh, what was um, uh, you know, out of order, the chaos, if you will. And if you remember in Genesis 1, he, he brought forth order to it. He brought forth from chaos to cosmos. And the, the word cosmos simply means to order something, to place it in order. And I've, I've told you a number of times, that's where we get our English word cosmetics. <laughs> our precious ladies, they wake up in the morning and they take what is disordered and they apply cosmetics to bring order to it. And, and, and so our God is a God of order. He did that with the world. And, and, and the reason he does that is he wants to bring forth, we now know, the ultimate redemption of humanity. And to do that, there needs to be order. There needs to be authority. And God has created, uh, God has created three uh, significant institutions that have uh, wrapped itself around every culture since the beginning of time. And that is, he's created these three institutions to maintain, to keep order in, in our culture. Uh, the first is the family, the second is, is the church, and the third is the government. And, and, and so he, we have scripture for us. Uh, take family, for example. He says, here's how we're going to bring forth order in this, and that is Ephesians 5.22, when it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as, as to the Lord. Uh, you take church, for example, and here's what he says to the church, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then lastly, uh, government. We've talked about government uh, recently. Romans 13, 1 says this, uh, let every person be subject, uh, be submissive to, submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So God has created uh, all authority uh, inside these institutions to to uh, push back chaos and bring forth cosmos and order to it. Order and responsibility uh, basically come uh, in each one of these areas. In the family, it's, it's the wife to the husband. In the church, it's, it's the church body to the elders. In the government, it is the citizens uh, to the governing authorities. And, and this morning, I want to get after really quick here, and I want to chase down uh, an aspect of submission that gets mothballed really quick uh, in our lives. And that is what is I refer to as mutual submission. Um, there is a, a theme in Scripture that it pops up in, in a number of places where we are told that there is to be inside the body of Christ, there is to be this mutual submission one unto another. That, that this is not just for a particular institution created by God. This is how the family of God operates together. And so that is submission one to another. And so if you would, look at your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 5. And, and let me remind you, in Ephesians, Paul 
In the first three chapters, he lays out all of the theological underpinning of the gospel. And then chapters four through six, he explains how does the gospel actually work out in our everyday lives. And in chapter five, he's in the thick of it. And and, and notice we start, we'll just kind of parachute into verse 15 here as he's talking about how does the gospel play out in our lives. Verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. That's a good word for us. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But, but, here it is. What is the will of the Lord? To be filled with the Spirit. Hey, Paul, that sounds kind of mystical. Do you have any way to show me how a man or a woman is actually filled with the Spirit. How would I even know that? Well, glad you asked. Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now stop there for a moment because some of you are still back in the camp of, wait a minute, Pastor Todd said one of the institutions God created for us to submit to is the government. And, and, and just a couple weeks ago, Pastor Todd said, uh, we're not gonna obey the government well, when they have told us that we can't sing anymore. Um, well, I tell you, the exception clause to submission, Acts 4, is when, when, when a, a person, an institution, uh, requires that you obey them And by obeying them, you violate the word and the will of God himself. And when that that happens, uh, we know in Acts 4, we go go with it's better to obey God than man. The reason I I said, hey, we're going to keep singing is because it's a direct command here in Ephesians 5. It's a direct command in Colossians 3 that the people of God are to sing. The people of God are to make melody. The, The people of God or to address the, uh, one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing is such a big part of God's agenda of worship that he created a whole song book for his people and put it in the Bible. So, so that was where the line gets drawn of, wait a minute, no, we, we're, we're commanded and called to be singing praises to God. I digress. Verse 20, how else do I know someone's spirit-filled? Well, they're always giving thanks always and for everything. And for everything, COVID, everything, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now here's our text today. How do we know somebody is spirit-filled, spirit-empowered? Verse 21, they are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the command of Scripture. That's That's the declaration of a man or a woman who is filled with the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you're not saved. Romans 8, 8. There's no such thing as a a non-Spirit-filled Christian. The moment you give your life to Christ, the Spirit of the living God comes and takes up residence in your life. And one of the evidences of that truth, that fact, is that you and I practice this daily, uh, sometimes hourly submission one to another, this mutual submission one to another. So what Paul's saying here, Paul's simply saying submission, submission to one another is a result of a spirit-empowered, spirit-filled life. You know, uh, so many times I find myself in the bucket of self-willed. And Paul says, no, 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 Todd, you need to be spirit-willed. Let the Spirit of God work on your heart in such a way that your brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, even your kids, uh, your spouse, your wife, your husband, uh, man, it's just there's this attitude of submission towards each other of you before me. What does this submission look like? Well, it is a really you before me. Submission is this deferment one to another. Uh, this, is a, this is a self-choice 
of surrendering your will, your want, your wish to that of another person. Submission can never be demanded by somebody because if it's demanded and then that person submits to that, that's compliance. And God, God, God didn't call us uh, uh, to be saved and to fill us with his spirit to merely comply with each other. No, he wants submission is a, a gift that you give to somebody. It, it is a, it's an action of grace. It's an expression of mercy. And, and so what you have to understand, it's this beautiful, uh, victorious surrender. Yeah, it sounds like an oxymoron, victorious surrender, but that's really what it is. It's the conquering of self, there's the victory, and the surrendering, surrendering self-will uh, to that of another out of love and grace and kindness and mercy uh, and, and that of encouragement. And, and so the, when you think about the word submission here, we can go right back to the etymology of the word itself. Uh, the, the, our English word submit, submission, uh, it comes from the Greek word hupotasso. Hupotasso is two Greek words put together. Boom, you put them together, you get hupotasso. Hupo simply means this. Hupo means under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tasso uh, simply means to arrange. You take those two separate words, hupo, tasso, boom, put them together. You get the idea of to arrange, uh, to arrange oneself, to arrange some object, to uh, arrange some attitude, arrange some action, under something, under, under a principle, but, but here we're talking about a person. So I, I willingly uh, and willfully surrender and come under uh, the order of another person. It's a military word, actually. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, that's the problem with this whole submission. It's all, it's all about the military. It's, milita it's just militant. No, 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 no. It's a military word that Paul used, not to show you some sort of attitude behind it. He was, he was using this to, to help us see the process behind it. You know, we have, we have five-star generals, we have four-star generals, three-star generals. Man, there's an order to that. We, we, have, we have this idea that, man, uh, any authority is bad. No, authority is a wonderful thing. It's not perfect here on earth. In heaven it will be, but it's not perfect here on earth. But, it, but, but what it does is it keeps the world from spinning into chaos. And, and, and so the, it's, the, it's not uh, militant in attitude. It's, it's military in process of how I come under arrangement. In fact, it has it has. Well, let me say it this way. I don't think it has anything necessarily to do with the person you're submitting to. Uh, you, you look at the word submission. When Paul calls us to submit to someone, he never talks about their worthiness, their, whether they deserve this. He doesn't even in this passage, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not, not just out of reverence for, for that person. Is Man, they may not be deserving of my submission, but I'm, I'm going to submit to them because my Savior is, is, is asking me to do this. That, sort of that word reverence, that's that Greek word phobeo. We get our English word phobia from it, the idea of fear. In other words, submitting one to another out of fear for Christ. And, and I don't mean like shaking in your boots or uh, that type of fear. It's a respectful fear. That's why we translate it as reverence. We honor this. It's like electricity. I'm not in fear of electricity pumping through my walls of my home. But if I work on something that's electrical, I have a high respect for it. I, you know, I change a light bulb. I, I call Southern California Edison in LA and say, turn off the main grid. I'm about to change a light bulb. Why? Because I have a fear, a reverence, a respect for it. And here's the deal, Christ follower. Paul says, inside of a family of God, inside of a church, there's this mutual submission that's going on, not because of the worthiness of the individuals, but because of reverence and honor and respect of Christ himself. Now, to really submit, there, there's really two things that have to happen in a person's life for submission to actually happen. 
And that is, there has to be an attitude of submission and there has to be an action of submission. Did you catch that? An attitude of submission and a action of submission. Why do I say that? It's because Jesus Christ, the ultimate picture and portrayal and demonstration of submission was completed by Jesus Christ. And he did it in both his attitude and in his action. You see, submission is, 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 a, is kind of a meta-narrative that is woven through the gospel. That, that Jesus Christ submitted to the will of the Father and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so I want to I want to look at I want to look at both of these because if you if you have just one and not the other you don't have submission. What do I mean by that? If if your attitude is man I I surrender my will you know you before me how can I serve you and, and I have a great attitude but when it comes right down to it I never do it then there's no submission. Or the other side is I actually I want to serve you I want to honor you I respect you. And, and, and here, I'm gonna submit to your, your, your wishes, your will, your want right now, but guess what? I'm gonna have a horrible attitude and I'm gonna make you pay for it. Well, what you have, you don't have submission there. It takes both. So I wanna start with the attitude. Number one, a submissive attitude is essential to, to honor Christ. Remember, this is all out of reverence for Christ. Uh, uh, we're, 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 not, we're not being asked by God to, be gone, to become compliant again. You know, it, it's not compliance that, that, that this, uh, a spirit-empowered believer does. It, it, compliance um, is, is, is more of a, um, a, just kind of a legal aspect of I, I comply. I, in my previous life, secular life, worked in a business where there was a compliance officer and their job was to you know, go around, make sure everybody's complying, and if they're not, they're gone, right? That, that, that's not the abundant life, okay? Um, we, we were not saved and put into a family to, to merely tolerate each other until this thing's over. No, that's not at all. This, there's a submissive attitude we're supposed to have. And attitude, it seems like, is something someone has all the time. I mean, attitude is everywhere these days. Uh, my mom used to say to me as a kid, hey, Todd, I, I don't like your attitude. Hey, Todd, change that attitude of yours. Uh, it, it, the cool thing is to have an attitude these days. I often say go to the Valencia Mall, which you can't right now, but when you can, go look at the mannequins. You stare at them and you just, their faces, they even look like they, they have an attitude. So, so what we want to do is not just get an attitude, but we want to get an attitude of submission. Case in point, if, if mom says to little Susie, hey, Susie, sit in the chair. Susie says, no. Mom says, Susie, sit down in the chair. Susie says, no. Mom raises her voice louder. Susie, sit down in the chair or I'll paddle your bottom. Guess what? Susie sits down in the chair, but Susie looks up at mom and says, mom, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> well, what do we have? We have compliance, but no, no right attitude. So, so where do I get this? Well, I don't have to look past Jesus to get this. I remember Paul as he uh, wrote uh, to the church at Philippi. He says in Philippians chapter two, five through seven, you'll see it on the screen. He says this, have this, have this, ready, ready, ready? Attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So question is, question is, is this uh, attitude, um, uh, am I, is it really worthy of my time? Maybe I, maybe I don't have to have this attitude. Let me tell you, if Jesus Christ has this attitude. Let me just tell you what it is. It is a fantastic attitude, okay? That, that's how good it is. He says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, explain this attitude. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself 
taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. What did he do? He had an attitude of submission. He had an attitude of submission. He didn't come to earth and for 33 years make everybody in Israel miserable because he had to come down and become a man. I mean, he could have done that, right? He could call down a legion of uh, angels, wipe them out. I'm not gonna feed the 5,000. I'm gonna fry them. No, what does he do? He has this attitude. That's why just before he goes to the cross, he's back in Jerusalem, and he says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. As a mother hen would desire to gather her her hands together. So I have tried to bring you together with me. And I look out at the multitudes, number of times Jesus says, I was moved with compassion. Jesus displayed this attitude of submission throughout his ministry. You know, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians Jesus Christ, the gospel, reconciles us to God and puts us in a family. And when we get put in this family, it's this idea that we get reconciled one to another because we're part of the family. And we have this attitude. The attitude of submission is heard. And when I try to put some flesh on the bone here, is heard in, in, in phrases like, Hey, whatever, whatever you prefer, let's do that. Hey, hey, why don't you pick the restaurant? Hey, why, why don't you choose the, the show on Netflix? You say, well, those aren't real big spiritual things. No, those are big, those are big spiritual disciplines that demonstrates attitude because when you don't have the right attitude, it's usually in those simple things where you see the wrong attitude. It, it, it shows up with you before me. Uh, it comes with to, hey, how can I serve you? Hey, I, I'll lay a lot, aside some time and talent and some treasure over here, and I just want to come and serve you in this moment. And I want to do it, watch this, want to do this with a happy heart. In other words, that I'm going to go do this, but my attitude is that of a happy heart. That's why my, my wife always taught her kids uh, when, when, whenever they were disciplined, or they were told to do something, they were always to do it with a happy heart, happy heart, happy heart, happy heart, which I loved until she turned it on me. I mean, I remember one day she goes, well, Todd, I don't sense you have a happy heart. <laughs> You're right, I don't have a happy heart right now. But we want, we want, we want to be spirit-filled believers, empowered by the Spirit, Because we need the power of the Spirit to do this because the attitude of joy of serving another doesn't always come naturally. In fact, rarely. We need the supranatural work of the Spirit of God in us to produce that. Number two, number two, not not only your attitude, but that of action. In other words, you can't just say, hey, I want to serve you, but I never serve you. The action of submission is, is, again, to honor Christ. It's not only to honor Christ, but both of these, attitude and action, it's actually to mimic Christ. Remember, submission is not something you are. Submission is something you do. Submission is something, something you do. You get back to the word itself, hupotasso, to, to arrange yourself under someone, something. In other words, you do something. You arrange yourself. You, you take action. You demonstrate this. You say, well, <laughs> that's the problem with submission. I just don't like that part. No, that's, that's a big part. And, and, and Christ, again, is our example in this. See, everybody thinks submission is that dirty little word. It's not. It's, it's the attitude and action of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, who Paul says in in Colossians chapter one, all things were created by him and through him and for him. He's the second person of the Trinity, but in action and in attitude, he said to God the Father who he existed eternity past with. 
Let me submit my will to yours. In fact, that's his purpose statement. We always talk about having a purpose statement in life. Jesus had one. John chapter six, verse 38. He says, for I have come down from heaven. You know what that is? That's an action. I have come down from heaven. Let me just tell you, if you come from heaven, anywhere else you go is, 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 is degrading, okay? It's, it doesn't get better outside of heaven. So his action was that of hardship. So here's, here's what it is. For I have come down from heaven, now here's the key point, not to do. So Jesus immediately attaches submission to this, this do thing. He says, not to do my own will, but, but the will of him who sent me. He, he says, I will, take my, I will take my life. We should have learned from Philippians 2, his attitude. He didn't sit up in heaven and go, Father, wait a minute. Hey, can't we send one of these angels to do this? No, he, he submitted. He submitted to the will of the Father to do his will, not his not Christ's will. Was it hard for him? Yes, it was. Even the night before he's crucified, he's still talking to the Father. Lord, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. And the silence of heaven was the moment in time that Jesus made the final decision of submission to the will of the Father. It's a do thing. It's an action. And loved ones, let me tell you, if it's good enough for the second person of the Trinity, it is worthy of us to do this one to another. May we be spirit-filled people who don't just have the attitude, but we actually... We actually have the action. We do something with it. It's like parents, if you said to your your son, Johnny, you said, hey, Johnny, go up and clean your room. Looks like a tornado in there. You gotta get that thing cleaned up. Okay, mom. Johnny runs upstairs. Hour later, mom, you go upstairs. You find Johnny in his room. Still looks like a tornado, but he's sitting in a circle with all of his friends. And you say, Johnny, I asked you an hour ago to go clean your room. And Johnny looks back and says, oh yeah, no, I know, Mom, uh, but what what we decided to do, we're having a little small group uh, and we're just talking about what does it mean to go clean your room? And Peter over here, he's sharp as a tack. He's actually parsing the Greek words of go clean your room. And you're like, oh, Peter, that's great, Johnny. I didn't ask you to have small group about it. I asked you to do it. You see, talking about submission isn't enough. There needs to be an action behind this. You may agree with submission. You may esteem submission. You may value submission. You may even teach submission. My question to you is, can you remember the last time you actually submitted? That's just a question between you and Jesus. Because it takes both attitude and action. So what does this look like? How does this play out in everyday life? You know, if, if, I, if I leave here, um, what does it look like uh, maybe this week for me to submit? Because I think everybody in this, in, in listening to my voice this morning, uh, trust me on this, this week you're gonna have multiple times where, where Jesus is giving you an opportunity to exercise this mutual submission. Uh, it happened to me. Uh, we, were, we went on vacation, uh, as you know, a few weeks back, and we went to Arizona, and we're driving there, and um, uh, we're, we're in the middle of the desert, and I don't know why, but apparently there was like a CHP officer for some reason wanted to talk to me like really fast, and so he came, he came really fast after me. In fact, he wanted to talk to me so bad, he even like did little lights and stuff to get my attention, and so I, I submitted, and I pulled over, and, 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 and um, he asked me, I says, do you know what the speed limit is? And I said, yeah, I think it's 70. He says, I, I clocked you at X. 
And, and I have to tell you, when he told me what X was, I was like, that's pretty cool, actually. And um, I said, wow, that's, that's amazing that you <laughs> clocked me at that. And, and actually, he was very kind, and I was trying to be submissive in attitude. So he went back, wrote me, a, wrote me one of these little love notes, and, and said, I'll, I'll write you up for only five miles over the speed limit. And, and I, you know, I thought, okay, here, here we go, Lord. You, you've just given me my sermon illustration uh, for submission, and um, I'll, be the, I'll be the hero of the story I submitted. And then it, I realized, no, the problem is the reason I had to submit to an officer is because I didn't practice mutual submission before then. Because my gracious, loving wife, in a very kind way, had said to me a number of times before I got pulled over, you thought you really should slow down, you really should check your speed. And my attitude was, don't, don't tell me how fast I can go. I got the, man, I, I got this thing nailed. I know, I can, smell, I can smell an officer 10 miles away, so I'll just break the law until I smell him. No, you know, I didn't practice mutual submission. I didn't surrender in um, attitude nor in action. And it reminded me, as I often say, when God says don't sin, he says don't hurt yourself. And I realized that I had failed in the moment to practice verse 21 of submitting to my wife. Surrendering to her and saying, you know what, you're... You're right, thank you for reminding me. I need, to, I need to throttle this back. My prayer for all of us this week is that God puts us squarely in the crosshairs of an opportunity of submission and boom, the spirit of God moves on our heart and mind and we go, okay, it's showtime. Both attitude and action. Here's how I'm going to be Jesus in this moment. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your grace. Father, thank you most of all uh, for your son, Jesus Christ, who both in attitude and in action submitted his will to yours. And out of that um, the attitude and in action, he provided an atonement for all of eternity to save your people, to be with you for all of eternity. Oh, the power, oh, the payback, oh, the ramification of submission is, is massive. So, Father, may we, in the simple, simple moment, in the um, kind of mundane moment this week, may we demonstrate with both attitude and action this mutual submission one to another. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, Crossroads, uh, like I said, be, be ready uh, to... Uh, here and see our Wilderness 3.0 plan. We'll get it out to you as soon as we get everything kind of locked down. And um, uh, until then, fill out a connection card online. Let us know you were uh, here with us this morning. Let us know how we can pray for you. And uh, join us Thursday night. If, you, if next Sunday doesn't work for you, join us for a live stream Thursday night, 6.30. If not, stay faithful, and we'll see you uh, next Sunday morning.